Um, from man, that's right. God made everything good. He stopped after that sixth day and he looked. Even man was good. Realize when he says this, man's already there. So everything that he's made is very good. Okay? Now, man has this thing called free will. That's what's caused the problem, isn't it? But it's the way God made it. So in chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they got to take their apple, right? Or... Again, theologians claim it was pomegranate, but anybody ever hear that one? See, there are no apples where in that part of the country. In that part of the world, there are no such things as apples. Neither was it God said there was. <laughs> no, I ain't mean, what God said there was. He said it was fruit. But the main fruit there was pomegranate. So if you ever listen to a theologian, they didn't bite into it. I, I don't know why they don't bite into a pomegranate. I'm not a big fan of that, but that is something out there. I'm telling you, things get complicated in a hurry. Stick with apple and you'll be fine. Um, now, we all know they take of the, they bite the apple, they get themselves in all this trouble. God comes to them, and I'm going to start reading here in chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 19 on. And this is when he's giving out the punishment. In the sweat of thy face, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou was taken. For dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. See, everything goes in a cycle. <coughs> everything goes back where it started. It's the way God made things, including us. He, we came from dirt. We're gonna go right back. So everything goes back to where it came. And Adam, called, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, now it's funny, I, I preach this all the time, but the people don't notice it, and I'll just mention it and we'll keep going. God said, you messed up. Here's your punishment. Now let's get some clothes on you and move on. But how many of us want to lay and waller in our problems? How many people in this world want to wallow in all their problems? And they want everybody to know about it. God said, that was a mistake. That's a sin. You're out of the garden. Here's your punishment. Now, get some clothes on you naked people and let's move on. <laughs> so, I, I don't know that he said it exactly like that. But. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, let us put forth, it, put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat that he might eat and live forever. So we've got to take it out. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden till the ground from whence he was taken. So he has to go out till the ground now. He doesn't get to have the garden of Eden. Now keep reading. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east end of the garden of Eden cherubims and flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Okay? Now, Revelation chapter 22, the far end of this thing. <laughs> so you're going to be able to tell everybody you started in Genesis 1 and we made it to Revelation 22. And I do it all in about a minute. I have a question already. Now, just a minute. Let me read this. Let me read this and then we'll go to questions. Yeah, don't get ahead of me. You can't, you can't ask a question now. Oh, okay. There ain't a question to ask. <laughs> yes, there is. No, there ain't. I love mine. <laughs> and he showed me a pure river. Verse 1. He showed me a pure river, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street in it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. Now, when you eat of the tree of life, you don't die. It's eternal. That's why he couldn't leave them in the garden. We leave them in the garden, they're going to eat the tree, they're going to live forever. Even as evil as they are, they're going to live forever. God can't have that happening. So the entire time that man's been here, ever since Adam and Eve messed this thing up, God's been trying to put us back into a place to be in that same garden. Now this one is called the New Jerusalem. And it comes down from heaven. God's throne sits there. So... Everything on this timeline I do, it's going to all circle. It's actually a circle. 
It's a funny thing. But we're all going to eat of the tree of life. Why do we get to eat of it then when they didn't get to eat then? Back there. Well, no, because we're going to live forever. Because we're going to live forever. Yeah. And nobody's going to get there that's not perfect already. But not perfect of just being made perfect from the fact that Jesus Christ made us perfect. So we get to stay there forever and eat of the tree. And all 12 months, it's got a different fruit each month. And one month may be pomegranate. I don't know. One may be apple. Who knows? But every month, it's got a different fruit. It ain't going to be nothing old about it. And you're going to eat. And the leaves for the healing of the nations. Uh, the, the very fact that it's there is going to fix everything. Now, what about a question? Well, I, that kind of answered part of it exactly. What is the tree of life? Well, good grief. How would I know? <laughs> I know that's why I asked you. I don't know. It's a tree, and if you eat its fruit, you'll live forever. <laughs> I mean, how simple. I've it? seen Bob Ross draw a tree, and that's about as good as I can do. All but right. all I know is it's a tree. It sits in the middle of that garden. They weren't supposed to eat, and they did. But it means you live forever. The tree of life. But in the end, it's been taken away. Then it's going to sit in that new Jerusalem. And it's going to sit right outside the city wall, right outside the throne, because the river's going to flow from the throne right down through the main street. And on each side, the tree of life. So it's going to grow right there in the river. And the fruit's going to hang off, and people are going to come and eat out of it. Don't have cucumbers. <laughs> okay. I don't like them either. That's a fruit. Okay. I know it's not, but I don't like it anyhow. Okay. Now I'm kind of throw it off. Okay. Where was I going? I knew there wasn't a question there, no. Okay, I'll just start with that. So I'll start all over. This will help. I'm doing this to help myself out more than you guys. Okay? Now there's Adam. He was made. Everything was good. Okay, now you're going to come forward. And I want you to come forward with me. We're going to be in Genesis here. Because I want to show you why that timeline goes like it does. Now, I better stop at Noah, just for my own sake. Genesis chapter 9. I'm certain everybody here knows the story of Noah. How Noah was told to build the ark. Everybody's evil. Except for basically for Noah. He takes in all this. Genesis 9, starting with verse 20. Something gets overlooked here that's part of this whole story. Uh, and it explains a question that I think a lot of people have. And that is why is different people treat different ways. But, and Noah began to be a husbandman and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunk. And he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brethren without. Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And what's a lot of nakedness goes on in the book of Genesis, ain't it? <laughs> but it's just, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. And Noah awoke from his wine. Let's see, he woke from his sleep. He woke from his wine. He woke from his wine and he knew what his younger son had done. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Now, Canaan's Ham's son. Okay? A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So, you got the three sons of Noah. Now, I'm going to jump here and just put Noah in there. We'll just go from there. I got the flood up there, but I'm going to do it a little different. I'm going to put Noah in. Because I'm going to go to something else here. There's Noah. That's. Noah comes along, and what, what is it that God says about him? <coughs> Going to curse his people to be slaves. It, 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 I think I heard someone say that there was no something to do it, but I don't see it read here. Here it just shows that he sees his father naked and he, maybe he didn't respect him enough to do what the other brother did. 
There's some things you see that you ought to keep to yourself. Yeah. That's what my dad always told me. Because, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the story means. I just know that some things you better just fix it and move on and act like it never happened. So he didn't cover it. He wouldn't tell the others. Yeah, he wouldn't tell them about it. And then when Noah woke up out of his wine, he listen, what was that about? You know, you could have thrown that blanket on me and went on. So it's a matter of disrespect, I guess. I mean, I'm not positive, but I know that whatever it was, and that's what I've always assumed it was, that means that you've got a, a, a third of the people on this planet are going to be cursed forever. Think about that. There's only three sons, folks. This ain't real complicated. When you have three sons and God says all of your descendants are going to be cursed. You're right there. I didn't think of it that way. So why is it that, I don't know, here we are actually 5,000 years after Noah. <coughs> and 5,000 years, there's still people on this planet that are cursed, aren't there? How many people on this planet starve to death every day? It's in the millions. It's not a dozen. I mean, how many of us ever knew anybody starved to death? I mean, we, we read about Lottie Moon. And I don't know if most people realize, but Lottie Moon basically starved to death. Uh, she wouldn't eat her food because none of the Chinese kids had food. So she would give her food away. And they finally made her come home, and she died on the way back from all the health problems that she had from not eating. But you realize millions and millions of people a day die of starvation. Now then you got another son, and that's Shem, he's an older son, and he was like, hey, let's do this thing right. They put, so Shem is basically above. Now you're going to find out Shem is where we're going to get the next thing, which is going to come from a guy by the name of... Abram. That's the reason why Abram has a son named Isaac, and they say, listen, we can't let him marry him to none of these people. He's got the very Shem's bunch. He can't marry, and I guess he could have married Japheth his bunch, but that probably would have caused, I think that would have caused some trouble. So he had to marry into his own family because there's already been cursings put down. See, first the ground is cursed. You ever think about this? See, here the ground gets cursed because of what? Then here you got a third of the people that are cursed because of what somebody did. Now you come up to Abram, and God's going to change things around a little bit. And this is where the plan really starts that I'm trying to, to push. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And this is where God comes to Abram. And I will make of thee a great nation. Now what's he talking about? Israel. Israel. So I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. Now how many how many religions are actually based on Abraham?
Amen. You say he's head of the Muslims? Yep. All the Muslims came from him, too. They're still blessing them? They got a lot of oil, don't they? He was the father of Ishmael. But Abraham was the father of Ishmael, mm -hmm. who leads down through time to a guy by the name of Muhammad. So all those Muslims will still tell you that Abraham is where they came from. That's also the reason they think Israel's heirs, because Ishmael was older than Isaac. That's where their whole fight is over there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's ever sat down and just did a whole thing for you. But their whole fight is over the fact that they believe that's their land. Because Ishmael was the oldest son. So. He's going to bless the whole world by, well, we'll go on. I'll show you. And Abraham departed in verse 4, and he spoke, and the Lord spoke unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Herod. Boy, it seems like he could have found somebody just a little bit younger to work with, don't he? That might have been young then. <laughs> no, by this time after the flood, you know, 120 years or whatever is all you're going to live. So Noah lived to 950, wasn't it? Yeah, that was before the flood. That was the cutoff and people started dying younger? Yes, yeah, after Noah. I didn't know that. Well, he survived the flood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be difficult, but he. <laughs> yeah, but he was the end. There was a verse somewhere I'm not sure where where God said, "I'm tired of these people living yeah. so long, and so 120 years will be." Oh, really? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, and it is right here. Yeah. But anyway, we'll, that that's a whole other story. Let's not get off on that, okay? okay please. <laughs> I'm still. I'm trying to get this whole thing done in one hour. Okay. But yeah, I will look that up, I promise. So everybody stay, stay with me a little bit and I'll, I'll find that later. But it does say that, that 120 is as old as anybody can live. Okay? And by that time, you know, he's dealing with Abram here who's already 75. So he makes a covenant with Abram. Now this is that first covenant. First of all, he curses here, he curses here, and then he makes a covenant. And that Abrahamic covenant is what it's called. And that covenant is, I'm going to make a nation out of you. I'm going to bless everybody out of you. And boy, that's hard to, that's hard to buy into, but now turn with me just a little bit. Turn me over into Exodus. Exodus chapter 19. Don't want illusions. So in the process, Abram has Esau who goes and starts his little thing. He also has Isaac. And Isaac has Esau, I mean Ishmael. Isaac has Esau and Jacob, and Jacob takes his birthright. So now Isaac wasn't the oldest of Abram's, and Jacob wasn't supposed to have the birthright. This is all law, I didn't. Over and over and over, and we're going to actually get into Matthew chapter 1, and I'll show you more about it, I think, that if we can actually, if we can get there. But God is going to bless. But he starts this covenant right here. So we're going to go into Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. He has sons. One of them's named Joseph. Joseph takes them all down. Well, they actually went down during the, during the famine. And they all end up in Egypt. 430 years in Egypt. Now we're going to come back and I'm going to read to you Moses brings them out of Egypt. So you're talking here uh, basically 500 years later, give or take, maybe 600, but just give or take five or 600 years later, you have Moses. Let me write that one down. Now, Moses gets the law, right? Now right before Moses gets the law in chapter 19, I'm going to read verse five, I guess. This is where God tells him this part. It says, now therefore, now Moses got all the people out of Egypt. They're going back. God's going to once again start this property. They're all settled. There's literally millions of them. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. 
for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me. There you go. Keep going. Priest. Okay, now that's where you want to go. The word priest. That's spelled backwards, ain't it? That's what that means. That's literally what priest means when you when you actually break it down. A go between. When you break this thing down, he says, he says to Moses, now, I made this covenant with Abram. Now here it is, I got all these people, it's all set up. I'm going to give you the laws and the rules. Now, does God think for a second that he's going to be able to keep those rules? Does he think these people are going to keep all these rules? No. No, God's not silly. But he also knows human nature. What is the first thing we will all try if given a chance? Break, stretch the rules. <laughs> that, that's all right. I shouldn't ask that. We'll try to do things for ourselves. And if I can figure out how to do it, why would I want God to do it for me? Whether I believe in Him or not doesn't matter. Uh, why would I bother Him? Mm -hmm. How many times have people said, well, I just don't want to bother God with that stuff? Well, do it yourself then. So God says to Moses, live all, live all these rules. There's my covenant to make this great nation. Now, does anybody think for a second that these, well, it depends on which theologian you ask, basically a million people, that this was a great nation he was talking about? Does anybody think for a second that the one that was a lot, the, the nation that was here for Jesus was the nation he was talking about? Does anybody think for a second that the nation that's there now is the nation he was talking about? He's talking about the one after the... He's talking about the one at the end. Mm -hmm. He's going to make a great nation. And we're all going to be part of that. But how is he going to do that? Well, he's got to have gold between. So he makes him a nation of priests to start with. And he says, I've got to have the priest keep track of this stuff. They've got to be the gold between. So that's where the Jews came in. Really, this is where Jews started, okay? Even though these people back here were the descendants, there is no thing as Jew until Moses. This is where circumcision started. This is where the law started. This is where they separated out to become Jewish. Anybody got any questions on that? There actually is a question to on that one, don't Yeah, I'm thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, instead of being uh, uh, yeah, Muslims, they were Jewish. Is that what you're saying? Is that what I'm understanding? Muslims. No, I should have never went off on that track. Muslims okay. has nothing to do with this. Okay. I'm just telling you that Muslims come from Abraham also. If you ask them, uh, yeah. which they do, they come out of Ishmael, but they went off in their own world. Okay. This, this is, but this is the first Jew. I know for whatever reason we we start thinking that well Adam was the first Jew. No, everybody was the same. All these, all at Noah's time. Uh, all of Abram's people, the they, only thing that was changed was after the flood, you had a group of people who were out of Shem and Japheth that were going to be blessed. So out of Shem you get this. Abram and then Moses brings about all the law. So God's going to make them a nation of priests. Those priests are supposed to make sure that all the people are brought. Now, let, let me do this. This is the easiest thing to do. Zechariah chapter 8. We'll jump way forward, but if I don't go, I ain't going to get it done. I thought I could do it all just in a few minutes, and I was absolutely mistaken. Zechariah, way back there at the back. Zechariah chapter 8. Now, Chancellor, 
Would you put that on on the Isaiah 42 for me? Because I'm going to get that one and then this one. So I've got to do them both together. Because I want to show you the Isaiah 42, verse 1. But everybody stay in Zechariah. Because I'm going to show you where you're at in the picture. He's going to show you where the Jews are still moving forward. Okay. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now he's talking about Jesus. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised greed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment into truth. He wasn't going to fight to do it. So up front, way back in Isaiah, God's already telling these people, the way I'm going to do this, because they failed, right? By the time you get to Isaiah, they've already failed. Mm -hmm. They have not been a kingdom of priests. God says, I'm going to bring about my servant. He's talking about Jesus. He already had the plan. Okay? But he's not going to do this. Now keep going up. Verse 4 or 5, right in there. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord. He that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it. He that gives breath unto people upon it, and the spirit of them that walk therein. So he went all the way back to Revelation, and he said, the very God that made this place, this is how he's going to finish it. It's going to be at the end, but is that came yet either? Jesus didn't do that when he was here, did he? He did the first part. He came, and he made a way for the Gentiles, and he did it without killing anybody. He did it without war. He made a way for the Gentiles. So see, it's still clicking along here. Now you're all the way up into Isaiah now. Which, good grief. We're way on up here. Wish I knew how to spell Isaiah. There's Isaiah. So now he's promised the Lord. He's promised Jesus Christ there in Isaiah. Now, before you leave, Zechariah chapter 8. Uh, how about verse, let's read verse 20. That's right there where I can see it. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities. And the inha Now, he said it shall yet come to pass. Okay, now remember that. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and to pray before the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, well, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So there's coming a day when these Jews really are going to be priests. They don't matter how many times they fight it, don't matter how much they mess it up. Isaiah says, there's going to come a day when everybody in this world is going to know that the God of the Jew is the God. The only one. And they're all going to want to be part of it. They're going to come from many nations, strong in different languages. So again, is he talking about what's already happened? That had never happened, has it? So again, see, people read the Old Testament and we think, well, there's just this line. It's like God drew this wall. And when you get to Malachi, there's this wall. Then we start over. Now, a lot of the Old Testament is about the kingdom. And the kingdom's at the end. It's about chapter 22. It's about the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. A lot of this Old Testament. And we read it and we just pass over it. And we don't realize that it come to pass yet. Has God ever been wrong? God's not wrong. 
So I, I, I okay, let me do this now. Because if I don't, like I said, if I don't keep moving, if I get bogged down on one thing, I probably, I probably should have just did one of these at a time. Psalm chapter two. I'm actually going to back up this draw, but I couldn't do it right there. Psalm chapter two. Now, actually, I'm backing up to date. I better put it. Earth. Jesus is born. I'll move on out here. Okay, Psalm chapter 2. We'll probably end up stuck right here the rest of the time, but. Okay. Psalm chapter 2. Is it, I already, I already threw you off when I told you Matthew 24 was Jesus talking about all of the tribulation. Has anybody ever been told that Psalm chapter 2 is actually the story I'm telling you right now? No. Okay. Well, let me tell you. Psalm chapter 2 is the story I'm telling you right now. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now, when it's talking here, it's talking about the Messiah. Okay? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing. So it happened at the time that Jesus was here at the cross. They all got together. Now, did the how do I say this? Because I don't want to throw things off. I don't want to make it. Whose blood was Jesus on? You don't want to say the Jews because then everybody else will get down on you. <laughs> we said a big fight about that here. <laughs> it was, he was shed for everyone. Everyone. But the Jews got together. Now this says, why do these people want to get together and rave against, against the Lord? They get together and they say, hey, we got to get rid of this guy. When Jesus was here, which was some thousand years later almost exactly, we got to get rid of this guy. He claims to be the Lord. He claims to be the king. We got to figure out how to get rid of him. So they're, they're raging against him for no reason. Did they ever have a reason to, to kill him? I mean, they made stuff up as they went, and when it didn't work out, they just kept making something else up. Uh, you know, I think I heard a guy say one time, and I can't think of his name now, but anyway, kangaroo court. You know, they have those and, and different things. That's all it was. So why do they rage? And then, now who got in on it whenever the Jews can't figure out how to kill him? Who do they bring in? The Romans. Okay, now the Romans are all in on this deal. And did Pilate or Herod want to kill him? No, they didn't want the hassle. You know, listen, if, if, there's, if there's people who think this guy's something, leave him alone. You know, we don't want the hassle of all this. So why don't you just leave him alone? Well, you end up with a long story, and I can't make a long story short, but to halfway make a long story short, they come in to Pilate, and they said, listen, you know, we thought you were friends of Caesar. And whenever it all is said and done, they're basically blackmailing Pilate to kill Jesus. Now, you actually have to read between the lines, but it's right there. I mean, I ain't going to take, it takes an hour, it'd take an hour to go through it, but Basically, the Jews blackmailed Pilate into killing Jesus because they weren't allowed to kill somebody. So, why do they rage? Why, why, why do heathen people do that? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Who do you think it's talking about? It's talking about Jesus. The Jews, in, in David's mind here, at one day, and I don't know, because he's writing what God's inspiring him to write, but does he really have a clue what he's saying? He's basically saying that one day the Jewish people are just going to cast God off. Because he's talking about the Lord. Why, why would the leaders want rid of the Lord? And at the end of this conversation, he says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That really is what happened. That's
that's what happened in the time of Jesus. The leaders decided they don't want this. Let's just get rid of this. Let's cut loose from it. And David has already told him a thousand years earlier, that's what you're going to do to the Lord. Now, believe it or not, I am getting to a point. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. So God sitting up there, how could they break asunder God? They can kill Jesus right here at the cross. Okay? They can do that. They did it, didn't they? But what actually happened? That's right. They brought about grace. They were supposed to be, well, from here, all the way to there, they're supposed to be a kingdom of priests. That's spelled wrong. It's amazing I spelled that both ways. It's wrong both ways. <laughs> there must be a third way to spell that. That's what they were supposed to be. This whole time, they were supposed to be a kingdom of priests so everybody else can see. And all they ever did was try to get rid of God. But in the process of getting rid of him, it says God, God, God got the last laugh. Okay, now, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Okay, now that, that might have happened. Okay, now I ain't going to tell you that didn't happen. Depends on how you look at history. Thirty some years after Jesus, the entire city was burnt to the ground. In Jerusalem, there wasn't a stone standing. And nobody lived there for years. There was nothing left. Everybody was killed. So maybe that's what that's talking about. I don't know. I wouldn't say it isn't. Verse 6 then. It says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, when Jesus does return, back in the back of Revelation, where is he going to land? Where is his feet going to touch the ground? On Zion. On Zion. And when his feet hit the ground, the earth is going to shatter in half across Zion. I will declare the decree of the Lord hath said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. See, he's talking about Jesus through this whole thing. Like I say, David doesn't know it. He just knows what he's writing because God's inspiring him and he knows it's true. But before the fact, how do we know? That, you know David doesn't. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye shall perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We're supposed to know the story. We really are. We're supposed to understand that God didn't change the plan at any point. He's been working on this plan ever since he started. It doesn't change. We change. Yeah. So I'm going to leave that one there. Well, you know, we get all excited about the word predestined, but doesn't predestined actually mean the plan? Yes, it means that God has a plan. And, it was and all of our choices... I was always told that you're on a bungee cord, basically, and you're latched to the plan whether you like it or not. And you can go in, you can flop any direction you want to flop, but the plan God has is how it's going to end up. Um, so you're just, you're just going to constantly be, there's nothing you can do. That's what it says in, in Psalm 2 there. It says, they want to kill him, and in the end, God gets to laugh. And you know, they kill his son, and God gets the glory for it. Isn't that all? Have you ever thought about that? How tough that really is that that's, that's what we've got? Okay, let me do this thing. Real quick, while I'm still there. Matthew chapter 1. I've only got a couple more verses. Man. I'm back up where I'm supposed to be now. I'm basically at cross. Matthew chapter 1 is whenever he's born. So I'm right there. Okay. <clears throat> now, 
I just want I just want you to look real quick at Matthew 1 1 because I don't, then I want to move on. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham. Uh oh, why did he do that? Right off the bat, Matthew says this started because of Abraham. And we don't see that today. I mean, that's for whatever reason, people don't even think about that. Do you ever think why it didn't go back to Noah? See, Jesus could have went back. He would have come from Shem. And if you really want to go back, we all go to Adam, don't we? So he could have went back. And it, like I say, it definitely could have went on back just a little bit more to get him to Noah. But Noah's not who the covenant was with. Who was supposed to be made? He said, I'm going I'm to make of you a great nation. Okay, it's coming out. So Jesus comes along. Who was supposed to be the lineage for the king? David. They're supposed to be the kingdom of priests. Priests are a go between. What did Jesus end up being? The high priest. So all of it was already there. That's why Jesus says, I didn't come to away with the law. To fulfill it. None of this disappeared. Like I say, for whatever reason in today's day and age, all this is separate from this. And it ain't. It's not separate. Nothing whatsoever separates it. This is one story. And we just so happens that we live off over here somewhere. <clears throat> just so happens. And I think we're very privileged. You know, because when you get to right here, now I've the cross, and boy, this is a whole other lesson, and this will probably be for next week, but uh, the kingdom of priests ends up being us. But now let me show you one more thing. I told you I had one more verse. John chapter 5. Verse 5. So now, then you get this line. This is where the age of grace starts. We don't know how far it goes. I'll do that. There's a question mark there. Who's supposed to be that peculiar nation now? Well, we are, yes. <laughs> don't guess. <laughs> Wish I'd wrote the verse down now. I can't I, I know where it's at. It's on the left hand page of my right hand column about halfway down. <laughs> Ain't that a shame? We're the peculiar nation. The Gentile is now <coughs> this. The Jews didn't get it done. So Jesus came to fulfill all this stuff. Now, in this day and age, did anybody here ever think of themselves as a priest? Each believer is a priest. Every single, every single Christian who's ever lived was a priest. Jesus Christ is the goal between. Uh oh. I got some blank looks in. Wish I would have looked that verse up. Anybody got a good concordance in the back of their Bible to look that verse up for me? Look up the word peculiar, or you can look up the word priest. What did we look up? Right yeah, I, well, I can look. It'll just take me a while. I've got several pages. But it's going to be right there. And then there's also the nation that is over here on the right page, right hand column, at the top. Because it's in two different places. I better just let things go to that while I get ready on John chapter 5. I'm going to start verse 39. And they're, while they're looking at that, I want to see this before I go to that because I messed up. I try not to jump too much, but boy, this is, it's hard not to jump through this. Peculiar, I've got uh, four chapters. I mean, four books. Exodus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Titus. Try Titus. I don't think that's right, though. 214. Uh, 
and that's not the one I'm looking for. But I see what it is. It'll be under priests, I know. Is it Hebrews? Yeah, maybe. What's it? What seven, is it, Hebrews? Hebrews seven. That may be right. Uh, Let me see. Twenty-four, I think. There it is. We are priests forever. Okay. In the order of Melchizedek. Left hand call, right hand. <laughs> Left hand page, right hand call, man, boy, damn, there it is. Verse 22, it says, By so much was Jesus made surety of a better testament. Okay, Jesus came to make a better way. And he made sure that it was done that way. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continued, for, continued ever, had an unchangeable priesthood. And he's talking about Jesus. He's always going to be the priest. And then it's going to go on down and it says... And then they no longer need, for such a high priest became, became us, who is holy, harmless. In verse 27, who needs not to do daily those high priests to offer the sacrifice. Why? Because he, it is a sacrifice. For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which is since the law, makes a son who is consecrated evermore. So he is the high priest now. He's the golden twin. But we're still a peculiar people. And ain't that a shame? I can't. That's in there too. A royal priesthood. Oh, I better find it, because otherwise I'll be up all night. Everybody talk amongst yourselves. Is that what they say? <clears throat> Boys, king, this talks to change great until I'm looking for a particular word. It'll say royal priesthood, is what it'll say. First Peter 2.9. First Peter 2.9. Nope. Yeah, 1 Peter 2.9. It's 1 Peter 2, five and 2.9. There we go. Because I want Danny to be sure what he is. I hate that when I tell somebody something somewhere and I don't. I, I feel like I got to show. It. Now, it's right hand page, right hand column up at the top. <laughs> but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's us. We're a royal priesthood. I'll even put it all. On. That's us. Now, do you think we do much better than the Jews did? Well, it's, hard to, it's hard to figure it out, ain't it? Okay. Now, I jumped off what I was doing earlier. John chapter 5. <laughs> okay, now Jesus says this, and this is where I'll leave you, and you can look closer at this if you want to, but... John 5.39 says, search the scriptures. Now what's he talking about when he says search the scriptures? What scriptures does he have? Old Testament. The Old Testament. Okay? Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The Old <coughs> Testament tells you about Jesus Christ. That's what he just said. Search them. You think you got life in that? All they're going to tell you is I'm here. That's all all this does. All the way from Adam to the time that Jesus here is preaching, all of it just tells you that Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. Now here's what he's talking about here. Okay, the Messiah is coming. All this time from, well really Abraham wasn't looking for that. Moses, sort of. But by the time you get to David, then they say the root of David and so when you get into this area on, that's all the Jews talk about. That's all their message is. The Messiah. The Messiah. The Messiah. And now he's in front of them here, and he says, search out the scriptures, they got they're just going to tell you about me. The whole, the whole thing is about the Messiah coming. It's about the kingdom. But see, the Jews think the kingdom is going to be as quick as the Messiah gets there. 
So they're waiting on him to make this kingdom start. Okay, so here we go. Are they going to accept a Messiah that don't do things the way they want him to? And you will not come to me that you may have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you have not love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If any, if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Who's that talking about? Right here. Right here. So he tells them, all oh, that's about me, and here I am, and you don't want me? Well, there's coming somebody, and you'll want him. I hope you get everything you ever wanted. <laughs> that ain't what he's saying, God. I'll, I'll forgive me. I shouldn't have made that joke. But that really and honestly is what he's saying, isn't it? I don't, he's not saying it facetiously like I just did, with malice. But he says, you, you don't want me. All that talked about me, and here I am, and you won't. Okay. God sent you what you're supposed to be looking for. Now, here we are. So he's still talking there. So now I took you from Genesis, way over there, all the way through Revelation, and we went back and went through piece by piece, all the way into what Jesus is talking about, and what story after story, and I can, we can do this every week for the next five years. Every one of these will tell you the same thing. Man messed this thing up and God put it back together. And he's doing it in spite of us. That's the trick, isn't it? All that God blesses me with, folks, it's in spite of me. I know me. All that God's done all these years is in spite of us. Why didn't the Israelites uh, recognize Jesus as God's son? What was their problem? That was Psalms. They don't want God to be in charge. Okay. What did they want the Messiah to do? Anybody got it? Well, Anybody set up the, he was going to be there. He was going to be the king. King, yeah. And he's going to have this kingdom. And guess well, they're all they're all arguing. Even his own disciples. What were they arguing about? <laughs> Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Yeah. So they don't want what God's got in mind. They want what they got in mind. But how much different is it today? <laughs> it's not a whole lot different. So I guess I say that not to say we're bad people, but to say people are people. And it doesn't matter if we're Jewish or we're Gentile. We all still want our own little thing. That's what I read to you in Psalm 42 because of the question you just asked. In Psalm 42, they just wanted to put that asunder. They wanted to cut loose anything that this guy had in mind. Because this guy was, he wasn't tearing them Romans down. He's taking away their power and prestige. Absolutely. And not getting them anything in return. I mean, what was he offering them? <laughs> that's, that's all. <laughs> Seriously, though. I mean, I, again, I'm poking fun at stuff I had to poke fun at, and I, I don't mean it to be blasphemous. But that really is all he was offering in their mind. He's talking about this eternal life thing. Well, now, rest assured, you had these priests here. They broke up into two groups. Everybody know the two groups because you read about them all the time in the Bible. I can't even spell them either. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. Okay, now what you find out is the Sadducees, they ran the temple. Everybody know that? Sadducees ran the temple. They were the ones that was in charge. Of, they were the big wigs. Okay, the Pharisees, they were the ones that ran all the synagogues. They were the legal people. They were the lawyers, so to speak. So they ran the synagogues and told everybody what to do in the local places. And then once a year, twice a year, three times a year for the celebrations and stuff, they'd all get together. They'd all go to Jerusalem and the Sadducees ran that place. They were the politicians. Now when they get a Messiah, they want a Messiah that's going to run the Romans out and let the Sadducees run the whole place and let the Pharisees all be the lawyers. And here was Jesus saying, ain't no sense in that. <coughs> we still have trouble with lawyers. <laughs> and politicians. And politicians. <laughs> so don't think that ain't new either. <laughs> but that's that all these were. These people were politicians and these people were lawyers. And that's all they were. So that's all been the same too. 
So, but they, they, all he was offering was eternal life. They wasn't going to be in charge of anything. And then you got to back up and realize Sadducees don't even believe in a resurrection. Right, right. They don't believe anybody's going to be resurrected. Pharisees, they believe only a certain group would, and there, there was no hell, there was only a heaven, and just a certain group that were perfect according to the law, according to the rules. That little group would get to be resurrected. That's why they come to Jesus at the end, right before they try to crucify him and they try to trick him. And everybody remember the question that everybody pokes fun at? Here's this woman. And she got married. And her husband died. So she married his brother. And she still don't have any kids and he died. So she married the brother. No kids and another one died. So after a while they get down and she's buried the entire family. And they said, well on resurrection day, Whose wife is that going to be? Does everybody remember that question? Realize who asked that question. The Sadducees. Don't that just make you just burn you up? They don't even believe in a resurrection and they ask you questions about it. Have you ever, has anybody, have you ever stopped and think if you don't believe in something, you haven't asked too many questions about it? That's all it was. And the Pharisees are standing there, so if he says an answer about the resurrection, the Sadducees are all mad, and anybody who likes them is mad. Because they ain't no resurrection. Crazy outfit. we got to get rid of him. Blasphemy. And there's the Pharisees. Well, if he answers that there's no resurrection to suit them, the Pharisees are all lined up with their group. Wait till he says ain't no resurrection. We'll get him. What's the answer? In the marriage. There's no marriage. And nothing like that even, nothing like that even exists. But basically, he just goes, you know, be gone. Don't bother me. It's pretty much what he does. But that made even worse. Because now he's disrespected me. So all this comes about, and he says, I'm come, you don't believe me, but there's somebody else going to come, and you'll believe him. How can you believe which receive honor of one another and seek not to honor that that comes from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Okay, now. What's Moses got? The law. Your own law is going to condemn you people. I don't even have to. The very thing that you think you're, help, you're holding on to is the very thing that's going to condemn you. So he says, if Moses condemns you. For he, for had you believed Moses, you wouldn't believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you believe not of his writings, how shall you believe my words? So, there you go. I told you I'd try to get you all the way through there, but didn't quite do it. But So here we are again, somewhere in these parentheses here. Who knows? The age of grace... We're still waiting for the Antichrist to take over and we're gone and then by the, then you got a, the kingdom that's coming. And I want to end with some words that I left in with the first time. John, no, oh, Matthew. I want to end with these. Because I've already showed this to you earlier and I, I maybe caused more confusion. I'll try to back up and explain. Matthew chapter 3, and I'll start here and then I'm going to jump on. Boy, I wish I knew. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. John the Baptist preaching. What was he preaching? Amen. Repent you, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. Where's the kingdom at? This kingdom they're talking about, that's what they're wanting. If we're royal priesthood, we got to be part of a kingdom. See, here's the kingdom way over here. What's this crazy guy talking about? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, Jesus is later on going to say the kingdom is where the king is. So wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom's at. So John the Baptist comes in right here, and he says... Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, when you come on over into verse 17, 
From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, What's those next words? Have you got that there? Or you guys got it looked up? No, I'm on in four now. I jumped ahead of you. I went from 3 2 to 4 17. Is that why I lost it? I wonder why nobody read it. There you go. Uh oh. Same thing. So Jesus comes along and he says, Repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Right here. So he did all this right here. Now, let me give you one more thing. You know how old a priest had to be? Well, come on. 30. 30 years old. How old was Jesus whenever he went to John the Baptist? 30. 30. When the priest was ordained, so to speak, the first thing they did was they went through a ritual of washing. They went in, they were brought in, and they were all washed. What is it Jesus does when he goes to John the Baptist? He was baptized. He became the royal priest at that point in time. Now, was he already? He was what it was all about to start with. But he still went through every... He didn't break any of the rules. See, we keep thinking, well, if it was me, I'd skip that part. Ain't that right? Now, how many have ever thought that? Why did he skip that? That's a nuisance. Just one or two lightning bolts. I mean, how, how big a deal could a lightning bolt be? <coughs> Wouldn't be nothing. Just a couple of lightning bolts and he could have solved a lot of trouble. Amen? Amen. Well, I'll tell you what I told some folks one time. We were at the Baptist golf tournament. Pastor and deacon golf tournament. And it was a three-man scramble. A pastor, you're supposed to bring two deacons. And they had us all up at Windermere. Well, so we went over to that golf course right down, the, right down the road from Windermere. There at Camden's and whatever it's called. Big fancy one. We all got in there and there's just crowds of us standing there. And they come over and one guy walked by there and he stopped. And my cousin was the president of the convention. And he said... You want to say the blessing on the tournament? And, I, and it's real cloudy. And I said, somebody better because God can solve a lot of church fights with one Latin bowl. <laughs> he can fix a whole lot of trouble really quick in this crowd. Because we're all standing there with these metal sticks in our hand, you know, on top of a hill and a big black cloud over our head. Well, he could have fixed it. But he never got away, ever. He kept going line by line by line. He said, he told you all about me. David told you all about me. I went through here. God told Abram. God told Moses. Moses told the people. David told all the people. Isaiah told all the people. All the prophets told all the people. <coughs> My goodness. Out of all that, and here he is, and he says, listen, you've been told, and you don't want it. So, now was the kingdom of heaven at hand? Do you think Jesus was lying? Well, there was the king. The kingdom is where he is. And what you got now is, you got this thing where I got these parentheses. Why is there parentheses? Because these Jews look, the only way I know to explain it, and this is a real good way, because I saw a guy do it this way one time. You got Jesus is right here, the cross and all that. There's the cross. Here's where they were. Okay, And then you get up here, and when you get to a certain point, you can only see these angles. But all that time. So somewhere out there, there's a mountain that's that high. Because Jesus was looking through, and he can see it. <coughs> and that's where the kingdom is. And guess what? All this other stuff that the Jews can't see. We're living it. I didn't mean to confuse your words, did I? I confused myself. I'm glad you people are smarter than me. But see, they, one day is one thing and the next day is the next. And when it comes to the Jewish plan, God still ain't throw that plan out. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That plan is still plan. Only it's going to be here and at point, this point in time, we're the royal priesthood. We live in the age of grace. He's still preparing the kingdom. And one day, I already read it to you in Revelation 22, we're all going to live in the kingdom. And we're going to get to eat the tree of life. <coughs> the Jews, the 
that your grace for the Jews is an intermission. Yes, that's all it is. They're out for popcorn. Uh -huh. now, uh, that sounds like a joke, but not. The second half starts when the tribulation begins. Yes. Or the rapture. Yep. Then they come back in, we're gone, and they turn right around and start again. So really and honestly, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He left. He'll return. And that's all of it. Okay, now we've got any questions. Took longer than I meant to, but I still didn't get it all the way I wanted to. But I know you said in church age now that, that you know, Jesus is the high priest. Yes. Okay. We'll, we are a royal priesthood. Yes. All right. Priest means go between. Yes. All right. So the high priest, Jesus, is the go between between us. Between us and God. Right. Okay. We're the go between between the world and Jesus. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yep. Did I just I mean, mess you up? No. That's, that's I probably should have said that when I was going earlier, shouldn't I? That, that was my question. Yeah. That okay. So we're still a royal priesthood, okay. and we are the go between. We're just the go between between <laughs> a lost world and the high priest. Which is Jesus. Yeah. Now, Don has all kinds of questions now. <laughs> Anybody got any other ones? One or two things. Either I understood it all or I don't know enough to ask an intelligent question. <laughs> well, let's stick with you understood it all. <laughs> it's probably yeah. And that never stopped him before. <laughs> Yes. Between the world and Christ, that puts quite a burden on us. Yes, it does. We have basically the exact same burden that the Jews had. It really didn't change. He just got a different group to do it. Well, you said uh, the Jews aren't his chosen people anymore. No. Uh, I didn't want to see it. Well, I thought, I thought you did. Now, you no. said they, well, they fell out of grace with him. Let's say that. <laughs> Oh, they fell out of grace with him way back, back here. Back there, yeah. yeah. 400 and but he doesn't change the plan. The plan is still them. Yeah. And whenever he returns and takes us out of the picture, they're going to come in, and that 144,000 is going to be his chosen people. And what's their job going to be? Right back to what it's supposed to be started with. He doesn't let anything go unfinished. Maybe, I mean, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Nothing goes undone. When he starts something, it's going to happen. Every single time. And man may take thousands of years to mess the whole thing up. But ultimately, what God says is what's going to happen. And there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. So at this point in time, they're still his people. But they're, they're not what the plan is about. Like I say, they're at intermission. That's a good way to put it. They're, they're going out for popcorn while the rest of us are watching the show. Okay. <coughs> Let's all stand. Lord, we just thank you that you're that you're so